for these books, you're going to need one of these books, so make sure you visit the registration table out front and pick up one of those. Also, we are going to worship. Uh, that means that some of you, right, are welcome to come down front when we get started and just enter in to all the Lord has in store for us. Amen? So are you ready to pray? All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, we are here tonight for you. Lord, your word says, Lord, that we shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Lord, we're not here to learn a formula. We're not here to do something mechanical. We recognize, Lord, we can do nothing apart from the Holy Spirit. So we ask you tonight to come in this worship service to fill us with the Holy Spirit. We need you, Lord. We recognize that, that you sent your disciples to the upper room before they did anything to wait on the promise of the Father. And we thank you that day of Pentecost was not just a one-time event, but it was a promise that you gave for them, for their children, for all those who are far off, and everyone the Lord would call. So, Lord, we ask you tonight, God, for another Pentecost. Lord, if, if, if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, your word says, how much more will our loving Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? So we ask tonight. Could you just begin doing that in your own way? Just begin asking the Father. Say, Lord, we want more of you. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit, with the boldness and the courage, Lord, to have our identity rooted in you and the passion and the zeal to share your gospel. So, Lord, we're not interested tonight to sing a few worship songs. Lord, we need an encounter with you tonight. Another Pentecost, Lord, that the zeal for your house would fill us tonight. Come, Holy Spirit, as we harmonize even with the angels tonight. Lord, let the very atmosphere of this room change. Lord, as your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it's in heaven, we worship you. We bless you. Just come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. So you're just invited to enter in. You're welcome to come down front. Let's just engage with the Father's heart tonight in worship.
matter what kind of day I've had, no matter if it's raining outside, no matter if there's traffic, because you live here, there's always traffic. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Sing that with me. Praise the name. Just one more time. In praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord. time. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forever, for endless days. We will sing your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Just thank him tonight. Just thank him tonight. Just thank him tonight. Just thank him. Just thank him for his goodness. Thank him for his kindness. Thank him for his love. <laughs> the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song and you are good you're good You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let me. You're never gonna let me.
y'all need to wake up. It's just a little rainy, a little bit of traffic. Come on, I got so excited landing here. This is the land of sweet tea and the glory of God. This is the land of milk and honey. So come on, let's just sing this out. Let's sing this out with Meredith. This is how. This is how. This is how.
like tonight the Lord, you know, some of you feel like you, you have been just pushing against, let me just keep the, the groove going on. Some of you have just been feeling like you've just kind of been pushing against this thing and you just haven't seen breakthrough in whatever area of your life. It could be, you know, spiritually, it could be with your finances, it could be relationally, it could be whatever, but you just have tried everything in your own strength to try to open doors and it's amazing, you know, when you look at the paradigm that's established with Jehoshaphat and the paradigm with Gideon and the paradigm with Paul and Silas in prison and, and we're just breaking free in the American ta context to realize that worship is more than three fast and three slow. A couple people are pumped about that. It's more than just words on a screen. It's not, this is not a religious exercise. Praise is the open door. It is the breakthrough. And even as we share tonight about, you know, seeing God take over a city, seeing God touch a city, seeing God change a city, like we do that from the place of worship, from the place of praise. We can accomplish more in here in the next 10 minutes than in 10 years of striving. So let's just declare that tonight over, over the city. Let's just declare it over our own life. Come on, just sing that with me. Just say, oh, and praise is the open door. Praise is the open door. Just say, praise is the open door. Come on, just see it in the spirit. Let's just begin to lift our voice tonight. Let's just begin to lift our hands. Just lift your voice. Just begin to lift up your song, your sound. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to be real. It just has to be authentic.
like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. Your praise is the opening door. Praise is the teach you guys a new song tonight. It's a pretty old song, but it's too bad I don't do it anymore. Came a long way. <laughs> really simple. It just I just want to declare this over the city tonight. The chorus just goes like this. Jesus enthroned upon the praises of our heart. Jesus, you're the king and you're the center of it all. Jesus, enthroned upon the praises of our heart. the king and you're the center of it all. Sing with me. There is a name. There is a name who reigns without contention, whose power can't be questioned or contained with humble fame. He rules the earth and heaven his glory knows no measure or refrain. And his bursting past the border lies of space. Sing with me, Jesus. Jesus, enthroned upon the praises of our
enthroned upon the praises of our Father. Jesus, you're the King and you're the center of the heart. sing this over America. You know, coming out of this another crazy election and so much strife and so much confusion and you know what happened last week in Pittsburgh and then what happened in California yesterday. I mean, it's just like, Jesus, sometimes you got no answers. There's no strategies. It's like, we gotta have you, Lord. Anybody with me? I mean, it's like, I don't want to read another newspaper. I don't want to hear another blog. Like, Jesus, you got to come and touch our nation. Like, this is the only hope. And Lord, tonight, God, we sing not from a place of indifference and not from a place of confusion. Lord, we sing of your greatness. We sing tonight that you are on the throne. You're still on the throne, even when things don't make sense. Even when there's so much political turmoil, even when there's so much racial tension, even when Christians are really angry sometimes, God, you're still on the throne. So come on, let's just lift our hands. Let's just declare this over America tonight. God
Just sing this out real loud tonight. Hallelujah. And hallelujah, our God. Hallelujah, our God. Sing it out. our voices to the Lord. These are powerful words we're singing, hallelujah, that he reigns, he reigns. And here's the amazing thing, is that he has set us in heavenly places with him. And as we're singing these songs about his reign and how he has authority over all things, we must realize that he's placed us in Christ who sitted at heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. 
and that we get to change the atmosphere through our praise as we join him in the throne room. Let's even right now, let's just continue to lift our voices right now. Let's continue to lift our heart. There's realities that are true whether we feel them or not, and they're true even if we don't believe them or not. They're true because they're true. He reigns on high. He is the good news because he's in control, because he is good, because he is sovereign, because he is wise, because he is all-powerful, because he is generous and benevolent, because of his mercy. This is the good news, and he has gave, gave us seated in heavenly places. Jesus, Jesus, we're here because of what you've done in us. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, can we just sing that chorus one more time? Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, this is a fact. Hallelujah. Let's just step right into that reality. Amen, amen. How many enjoying so far tonight? Amen. Well, it's just the beginning. It's just the start of a great weekend. You can have a seat if you can. I want to. Uh, I want to bring up Andrew here in just a minute. Uh, we're going to take up. An, we're going to be taking up an offering. And uh, you might be wondering, like, well, we're just starting into this. We're taking up an offering. What, do we, what is this all about? Let me just before Andrew comes up, and he's going to explain a little bit more what this is all about. This is more than just an event that's happening tonight and this weekend. This is unto something much greater and much grander. It's unto the saints of God in our, in our region being mobilized to bring revival to our city. Is anybody else excited about revival? <laughs> that's what this is really all unto. Andrew, come up. I want, to, I want Andrew to share briefly about what this is unto, and then we're going to go into the whole weekend and stuff. But there's a broader picture that we want to invite everybody into to understand about what this, what's going on tonight and this weekend and, and why being here tonight and being here this weekend is important, but more than that, the after effect and why it's important to sow even tonight. Andrew, give us a little bit. Thank you, Gabe. So glad that you guys are here. I, I want to tell you guys just a little bit of, uh, about myself uh, and my, my testimony uh, before a little bit about what we're going to be taking up the offering for tonight. Uh, my wife and our kids, we live in Columbus, Georgia, just a couple hours from here. Um, and we uh, run the ministry, uh, take the city along with our team there. We travel all over the country and we basically partner with local churches to mobilize churches to reach the lost in, in those cities all over the U.S. And so um, over the last several years, we've been doing that all over the U.S. And we've never been in Atlanta, uh, but I am from uh, this area. I actually grew up in, in Marietta, Kennesaw. And just a little background about my story. Uh, my Actually, my mom and dad are here. My Nana is here, which is, she's right here. Let's give my Nana an, a hand. She's awesome. Well, th my mom, dad, my Nana, my family, you know, they really uh, prayed for me through a season in my life. From about the age of 15 to 21, I battled with drug addiction. And at 15, started using prescription painkillers in high school, went to Sprayberry High School. And uh, at 18 years old, tried heroin for the first time. And from 18 to 21, I battled off and on an addiction to heroin. And at the end of my addiction, wound up homeless in downtown Atlanta, strung out on drugs and suicidal. And really felt like that there was no, absolutely no hope. But how many of you know that God is able to redeem and save people? 
you know, God intervened in my life. And in, in 2009, uh, my dad found out about a program. My mom and dad found out about a ministry called Teen Challenge, and they got me into that ministry. And while I was in Teen Challenge, uh, I was discipled, and I began to just really learn what it meant to obey Jesus and follow him. And he radically transformed my, my heart and my life. And I've never moved back to Atlanta since that time. And we've never done an event in Atlanta. We've been all over the country, we've been all over the world, but we've never been back here. And so actually for about four years, I would say I've had my eyes on Atlanta, but I just felt the Lord was saying to wait for the right opportunity. And I really feel like in the last six months that the Lord has said that, that we're to not only come and host an event in Atlanta, but actually that we're to, to begin uh, a focused kind of blitzkrieg into the metro Atlanta for 18 months that we would begin to launch a series of 18 events in every corner of Atlanta to reach tens of thousands of people with the gospel. And we're calling it Reach Atlanta Campaign. And so like actually tonight is really the first kind of time we're even talking about it. And the reason I'm excited about it is because I believe that my life is a sign and a wonder to the principalities over the city that that they don't really have a hold on people in this city, that God is able to redeem and to save. And I just want us right now to just simply declare this, Atlanta shall be saved. Just right now, Atlanta, Atlanta shall, shall be, be saved. saved. Let's say that again. Atlanta, Atlanta shall be saved. saved. One more time. Atlanta, Atlanta shall, shall be saved. saved. And I believe that the Lord is calling us to, to step into that. And so I want to just say, say this to you guys. This event is totally paid for. Sean, him coming out here is paid for. This was a free event, but everything has been covered because of just generosity from people and generosity even from this church that you're in right now. And so tonight we're not trying to raise money to cover, you know, a light bill or whatever. I want to actually ask you guys to sow a seed into the city of Atlanta. And what this, everything that we raised this weekend is going to go directly into reaching Atlanta with the gospel. And I believe that there are going to be tens of thousands of lives that are going to be transformed. And I believe that right now, the only hope for America is not a political party, but it's Jesus Christ. Amen. I just, I'm just convinced. How many I'm guys believe you. that? I'm with you. We need Jesus. Yes. What Sean was saying is true. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let uh, yes. Gabe just finish off the, the offering, but I want to invite you guys to sow in uh, to the Reach Atlanta campaign. I believe that we're going to see a, a powerful shift in this city as the body of Christ comes together and we go out and, and reach the city with the gospel. Yeah, and I believe this, that, that this tonight, tomorrow night, and Saturday, your life is going to be transformed uh, by the by this by what's happening here and not only your life but people real people out there that don't know Jesus right now but they're going to know them this weekend which is really exciting guys like Andrew who who were lost but then radical transformation uh, coming to Jesus and I believe that's what's going to be happening this week I know it's going to be happening this weekend and so there's a a, a way to give um, you can make out checks to take uh, take the city but also you could do online giving at give take the city.com. And so I want to encourage you, if you just pull out your phone, you can pull that out or you can take a snapshot of that. And uh, um, so you can give later, um, but we're going to pray. And what we're doing, I just want to emphasize this. When you are giving, I want you to see this, this is going straight into the lost getting saved. Yeah. It's going straight into the kingdom work. And so uh, let's just lift our hearts to the Lord with this. I know we, you know, in church settings, we take offerings all the time. It's like every time we gather, we're going to take an offering. And that's all good. It's fine. We're supposed to be doing that. But this is, this is, this is important, and it's very fruitful. And, uh, um, um, and so I just want us to prepare our hearts. So let's just pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for the life-transforming work, Lord, of your gospel. For one person to another, Lord. And, Lord, how you transform lives. Lord, we thank you for this event. We thank you for this ministry. We thank you for our friend Andrew. And, Father, we take this provision that you have given to us. And, Lord, we, we hand it right back to you. Say, Lord, let thy kingdom come. Your will be done. Lord, expand your kingdom with it. Lord, let it grow and let it multiply. Let it be like the fishes and the loaves. God, and multiply. God, even take the two mites like the, the woman with the two mites, Lord, take the, the, even the smallness that we could give or the bigness we give and multiply it exponentially. And we praise you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's going to be buckets that are coming up. I want to invite Josh Clements from One Race. Come on up. And Jordan. 
All right. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm going to tell you something. Rooms like this one matter. You know, and I'm standing here and I'm listening to the story and the vision of Reach Atlanta. And, you know, it, it, it excites my heart. It thrills me. It really does. You know, with one race, we get to talk about the other half, the implication of the gospel, which is to be reconciled cross cultures, right? But we don't ever get to really talk about being reconciled to God, man being reconciled to God. And so tonight, I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to be a part, thrilled to be a partner with this amazing movement. You know, I'm going to go off script here just a little bit, but I got saved. I came to the Lord as a direct result of an effort like this one. Someone came and knocked on the door of my house when I was 13 years old. And so can I tell you guys what you're doing right now matters? Can I tell you that efforts like this one matter? That they have eternal implications. That there is a Josh Clemens on the other side of one of those doors. That there is a Josh Clemens on the other side of one of those conversations. And you just never know where they might turn up. They might be proclaiming the gospel somewhere. You just don't know. And so I'm glad that you guys are here tonight. I'm glad that you're saying yes, that we want to get involved, that we want to be a purveyor of the gospel here in Atlanta and see this thing come to life. Amen. And so one race, we're pumped. We're thrilled to be in partnership with you. We're thrilled to run with someone that has a vision for Atlanta like our vision, which is to see revival come here in the southeast. Amen. Amen. And so we're thrilled to be a part. We're going to be doing some events together, partnering, and this thing is just going to continue to swell and swell and swell, and one day it's going to bust wide open, and we are going to see that which we believe for. So we're glad to be a part. Thank you, Josh. Um, so we've got 18 months like Andrew was talking about. We need some help. So if you have any sort of desire to learn more, to be a part of this, and, and I'm just going to stop here and say this week as I was praying about this weekend, um, the Holy Spirit and even sitting over here just really just confirmed that I believe there are some people actually sitting in this room who you've been praying for and the, the Lord has stirred your heart for revival. I, I believe probably most people here want revival, but I think there's some people sitting in here who the Lord has been pulling you so much for Atlanta. You've been, you've been hurting for Atlanta. And what I'm saying is um, this weekend could be a great way to, to really team with what we're doing um, to, to begin to reach Atlanta. So um, we do need help. We're going to need about 30 people across Atlanta. So if you want to, um, you know, in your little neighborhood, if we're going to have events, about 18 different events across all of metro Atlanta. And if you feel called in any sort of way to help lead that, um, I'm going to be out after this up front. Um, you can learn more about it, but there's also actually a number um, that if you want to just text to, we'll have your information, and then we can reach back out. And uh, Perfect. All right, we got it up in time. Good job, Andrew. Yeah, so it's 678-888-4793. Um, and, and if you're coming back this weekend, and I would really encourage you to, you're going to learn more about what we're looking to do. Now, I'm going to say this very quickly. This, um, this is not just about one race even. It's not about take the city. This is about what Jesus is doing in Atlanta. And I'm so excited um, for what God's beginning to move in all little areas. Um, so I would encourage all of you to come back the rest of this weekend, um, hear a little bit more about it. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really excited. Again, text 678 678- 888-4793. And afterwards, if you want to just hear a little bit more about what it's really like, what we need. I mean, look, if you are, um, you know, have any sort of, um, you know, talents at all with, uh, you know, digital or, or whatever, um, we'd love to use you. But also, if you just have a heart for Atlanta, you know, come talk to us and uh, we'll, we'll plug you in. Come on. Yeah. How many of you guys are excited? <laughs> all right. Thank you, Josh. Love you, man. Thank you, Jordan. I got two mics. What do I do with this mic? Just, I'll just give it to you, Gabe. That's yours. You can get it. I didn't want to. I didn't want to drop their like five hundred dollar mic. Um, well, welcome. I I am so glad that you guys came here. Um, my name is Andrew Chalmers, and like like I said, my wife and I we lead the ministry, take the city. We have an amazing team. Much of our team is actually going to be here this weekend, and I just want to honor um, the staff and the team, the volunteers, and all the people that are helping kind of assemble and put all this together through the weekend. So specifically like Newbridge Church, IHOP Atlanta. Can we just give them a hand and thank them? 
There's been a lot of work. I want to give you guys just a little bit of an idea of what you're in for. And I actually want you right now to pat yourself on the back for coming this weekend, coming tonight. You know, um, Take the City, uh, what we do is we travel all of America and host events that 90% of the body of Christ is terrified to go to. They're like, You're, we're going to have to do evangelism. We're going to go talk to people. We're going to share the gospel. And many, many times, I, I promise you guys, when, when we do these events, a lot of people... They'll even come to our Saturday outreach, which is what we're going to do on Saturday. And they're like, man, I, I don't even know if I should go. The whole way here, I was thinking about turning around and not coming, but I came anyways. And I just want to encourage you that coming this weekend, that you stepping out and being here tonight and tomorrow and on Saturday, God is going to do some dynamic things in your life if you'll be willing to step outside of your comfort zone. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results, you're going to be sadly mistaken. You're going to sadly come up short. You're, you're not going to see different results. But when you begin to step outside of what's comfortable and into what's uncomfortable, how many of you guys know you can start seeing radical new results? And that's what this weekend is about. It's about not just, you know, us telling you what to do and then you doing it alone. But it's actually about us as a community discussing and talking and dreaming about how we can transform our city by going out and sharing the gospel, uh, specifically with our community here in Gwinnett County. That's what we're going to be focusing on this weekend. And so what we're going to do is tonight, tomorrow night, and, and uh, also on Saturday, we're going to have times of worship. I, I believe even tomorrow night, we're going to have some focused intercession for the city of Atlanta. And then we'll have training sessions, and each training session will then be followed by an activity. So you're, it's not going to be like you're coming to, to, to church as usual. So tell your neighbor, say, this is not church as usual. Tell them again, say, this is not church as usual. Okay. Because you're not just going to listen and then get up and go home. We are going to actually require you to do something about what you just learned each and every time. So every single session, including tonight, we're going to participate with what we've learned before we leave the building. And so what we're going to do is we're going to begin to learn, we're going to begin to participate, and then on Saturday we're going to mobilize hundreds of people out into the city, and we're going to be seeing people get, getting radically touched by the Lord. They're going get, to get saved and healed and delivered. It's going to be amazing. So I just wanted to kind of let you guys know what you're in for. Uh, and I want to show you guys a little bit of a testimony. So this morning, uh, Sean, actually, he, he's from uh, California. He flew the red eye from San Francisco to get here uh, for tonight so he could be in time for sound check. So someone had to pick him up at 6 a.m. this morning, and that was me. So I went and got him, and I, I was glad to, glad to see him, uh, but it was very, very early. And anyway, Sean went to the hotel room, and he was asleep. And uh, I was bored because I was in East Point College Park, Atlanta, and was kind of just stuck with like five hours while he was asleep and nothing to do. So I went to Target to go shopping. And I walk into Target, and while I was in there this morning, uh, there were these like teenage kids, and they were in the bathroom just like, you know, playing with the sinks and like acting like a bunch of hooligans. And I like go in there, and I'm like, I'm like, it's 9 a.m. I'm like, what the... It's Thursday. What are all these, like, kids doing at Target at 9 a.m.? You know, I was kind of thinking, I'm like, I remember my days in high school. Like, something is up, you know. And so they all have uh, about almost the whole group, they leave the bathroom. One of the kids, you know, is still in there. And uh, I go out, and they're all standing there, and there's, like, four of them. And I, I just go over to him and I was, I was like, so what's going on in there? And they're like, they're like, oh, we were just messing around. I was like, okay. I was like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, oh, we're just, we're just chilling, you know, shopping. And I was like, I was like, you guys are in high school, aren't you? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> it's senior skip day. We're skipping, we're skipping school today. And I was like, I was like, oh, I remember those days. And so we, so I started just chatting and just reminiscing about my high school adventures and stupid things that I did. And anyway, suddenly I turned into Mr. Dad on him. <laughs> and I wasn't telling him to go back to school. I was like, it's fine. You know, whatever. It's senior skip day. You're supposed to be skipping school, whatever. But, but I was talking to him and it suddenly I just felt like the Lord was like, you need to tell him. Like they need to either, you know, start making some right choices or or things are going to just end up differently than what they're thinking things might end up like. And so I just started to tell them my testimony. I'm like, this is what happened in my life. This is what, you know, I did. And then, you know, I told them about when I encountered Jesus and how God changed my life. And they're just sitting there kind of listening to me. And, and so 
I had their attention and the other guy walks out of the bathroom and now they're all just sitting there looking at me and I'm literally at the entrance of Target. So I'm not in a very comfortable place. It's like really awkward, all these people walking by. But I just saw, the Lord said, just go for it. So I started preaching the gospel to these high school kids this morning that were skipping school. And I just started telling them, I was like, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. You were made to live in relationship with God, but your sin has separated you from him. But Jesus came to remove that separation so that you could step into what you were created for. And as I preached the gospel, I said, I said, do any of you guys want to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? And they all just like looked at each other and they were like, no, no. You know, they were like really nervous because I just put it on them. I was like, do you want to do it? And they were like, no, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I was like, I just kept going. I just kept preaching. And I was like literally preaching. And then, and then I was like, let me pray for you guys. And they're like, okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I was like, all right, we're going to pray. I said, bow your heads and close your eyes. And they were like, they immediately did it. <laughs> and I was like, we're going to pray. So I just started praying over them. And I said, I said, okay, while you got your eyes closed, I said, I want you to raise your hand if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ right now. And I looked, and this one dude, he's like. And then another one of his friends. And then all five of them raised their hand. And when, the, and when they raised their hands, they all started peeking, like looking at each other. And so eventually they just quit closing their eyes and they all opened their eyes. And I just began to pray with them. And I just, I, I just began to lead them in a prayer saying, God, I need you to forgive me because my life is full of sin. And I believe that Jesus Christ died for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. And right then and there at, 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 the, at the target entrance, they were radically born again. And they gave their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe... That God wants to do that times a million in America. Times 10 million in America. I believe that, that there is a word over America that America shall be saved. I believe that we are actually entering into a season of a great awakening. And that's different than a revival. People are praying for revival. And yes, I want to see revival. But I believe that there is going to be an awakening that even transcends revival that's going to begin to happen across America. And it's not going to look like a bunch of people showing up and lining up to get into a church where there's you know, powerful meetings. But I believe that what it's going to look like is suddenly tens of thousands of people a day are going to begin to get radically born again. I believe that there, I believe there's a wave of the LGBTQT, all the, all the letters. I believe that there is a, a wave. I'm promising you guys, there's a wave. There are millions that are going to be swept in. And the church, the church better get ready for the harvest. And we better stop judging people when we first see them. Because I believe there's a harvest coming in and we, we need to be prepared for a great awakening in Atlanta and all across this nation. And I just believe, I really believe that's the word over America. If you guys believe that, say amen. amen. So tonight, what we're going to talk about is, is we are going to uh, look at session number one. How many of you guys have booklets? Let me see your booklets. Woo! If you don't have a booklet, raise your hand. I'll have uh, some of... Uh, our team, they will go grab you a book. We're going to need probably five to ten books. So uh, just keep your hand up if you could, and, and they'll, they'll bring you those books. Okay, we're going to need like 20 or 30 or 40. <laughs> what I, what I want to do while you have your hands up awkwardly, I'm going to pray for you, okay? So you can just be like, yes, praise the Lord. All right, God, we just thank you for tonight. I pray, Holy Spirit, right now that you would fall on people. I pray, God, that you would touch hearts. I pray that you would open up minds to receive what you, what you want to say tonight. God, I pray for, for breakthrough. God, I pray barriers in people's lives that are keeping them from stepping into their destiny would be broken and that those things would be removed. I pray for radical breakthrough tonight in this room. I bind every spirit that would try to hinder or confuse or stop what the Holy Spirit's about to do right now. And I just release the peace of Christ over every person in this room in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're going to talk about tonight is identity. You know, and take the city this weekend, in case you don't know it already, it's really about learning how to go and win people for Christ. It's learning how to live a missional life where our lives are not only only about us receiving from God, but our, our lives become, you know, these rivers of living water where other people encounter God through us. 
where other people are drawn to God through us, where we are imitators of Christ, where when people are around us, that it's not only that they see us, but that they see Christ in us and that they begin to want to know him through our lives and through what we declare to them. That's what we're gonna be talking about this weekend. And I believe that many of you who have never led someone to Christ, never seen someone healed, never been able to go out and share your own testimony, I believe that this weekend is gonna be the first time. And I believe that it's gonna be the start of a new and exciting journey for you in following Jesus. And what I wanna do is just, before we dive into session number one, I wanna look at the page with the really, uh, the really cool bird right here. It's, it's, right, it's right on the back side of the front page. And it says this, our goal for this training is to journey with you in discovering the joy of representing God's love and goodness in everyday situations. Our goal this weekend is that each and every one of us, every single one of us, whether you've been serving the Lord for 40 years or four years or four days, that every one of us would increase our understanding and increase our encounter of the joy of the Lord in representing and representing God in our everyday lives. There's no greater joy than winning people to Christ. There's no greater joy than seeing people come out of darkness and into light. Literally, there's no greater joy in the Christian faith than to do the things that Jesus did. There's nothing more exciting. There's nothing more invigorating than that. And so this weekend, it's really about us going on a journey together to discover that joy. But the first session tonight, what we're going to talk about just really quick, I believe is, is a very important and foundational teaching that's going to help us overcome the barriers that keep us from stepping out and discovering that joy and living a life where we are representing Christ in our everyday lives. How many of you guys know there are barriers? I have barriers in my own life. I have distractions. I have busyness. I have worries. I have kids. I have a you know, a kid under two years old. How many of you guys, you know, we have distractions in life. There are things that hinder us, right, from doing this in our everyday lives. But God wants us to overcome those things and step into doing this all the time, where we represent Jesus everywhere we go, where we're seeing people getting saved everywhere we go, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our own families. God wants to use us in powerful ways. And so tonight, what we're going to focus on, I believe, is one of the greatest barriers for us as the body of Christ to step into that. And I believe that it's really ultimately tied to two lies. Typically, the number one thing that will keep the body of Christ from sharing their faith is not that they don't know the gospel. You know, most people sitting in this room, you've heard a guy with a microphone speak to you for an average of 35 to 55 minutes. You've probably had this happen. To, you've been in this experience probably thousands of times. And probably out of those thousands of times, at least half, you've heard the gospel presented to you. And so with that fact, the reality is, is you know the message of the gospel. So you're not here this weekend to learn a message that you probably already know. The issue isn't that you probably don't know the message. The issue is that there are barriers that are preventing you from proclaiming it. So instead of this weekend, let's focus on drilling in an ABC and one, two, three step that you can memorize. What we're going to focus in on this is let's get over the barriers that keep us back from sharing it. Because you know what happens if you get rid of the barriers? Suddenly you'll begin to share. It'll begin to come. And I believe the two biggest lies that prevent people from living this out in their daily lives it is directly tied to the way we view the Father and the way that we view ourselves. Our understanding of our identity and our understanding of the nature of the Father are the two primary reasons that we don't share our faith. And we're going to dive into that today. So let's look at a couple of the quotes. Mark Batterson, he says, how you think of God will determine who you become. A.W. Tozer, he says, the most revealing or foreshadowing fact about any man is not what at, he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. This is what A.W. Tozer is saying in that fact, or in, in, in this simple quote. He's saying this, what a person believes God is like determines his destiny. Your perception of God determines whether or not you're going to share your faith. Your perception of the reality of heaven and hell, that will determine whether or not you share your faith. But not only your perception of who God is and what he's like, but also who he says that you are. 
because you not understanding your identity in Christ will actually begin to be a barrier from keeping you from sharing your faith. Chris Valentin, he says this uh, one time I heard this quote. He said, whatever Jesus is to you, he'll be through you. You know, we're called to be imitators of Christ. Our life should be a reflection of who Jesus is. Our life acts as a filter where which people can either encounter God or not. The reality is the way that we see God will act as a filter that will diffuse and transform the way that people encounter God and the way that we minister to them. I want to give you guys an example. How many of you guys have ever been to Christian events where there's Christians picketing Christians at the Christian event and they're holding up signs? You guys ever been to those? I love those guys. Love you guys. Like passion conference. Passion conference is evil. You know, they're like standing out there like yelling about Louis Giglio. And now he's, you know, from hell or something. And it's like, why are they yelling at people? I was at a gospel campaign, a gospel campaign focused on preaching the gospel. And they were inviting people from all over the city of Portland. And this is a few weeks ago or a couple months ago. And they were out there, literally, th these guys with these things. They were yelling at people. And inside the convention center was an opportunity for people that didn't know Jesus on the West Coast to go in and hear Jesus. But you know what? As they walked to the convention center, every 500 feet, you know what there was? A guy with a bullhorn. And I'm thinking, like, man, <laughs> I wish these guys would go away, you know, because people, like, you know, there's so many barriers that will keep people from coming to a, a meeting or a gathering or a church. And they're sitting there just yelling at people. And I'm just like, man, this is so discouraging. Why are they doing that? And over the years, here's what I've realized. They're not doing that with a bad motive. They're not yelling at people, telling them that they're going to hell or yelling at people and screaming at them. And, and, and you know, like they're not doing that out of a bad motive. They're doing that because they actually think that that's what God is like. They think God's angry at everyone. They think that God is ready to smash everyone who sins. Just, you messed up, boom. You're not good enough. You need to get right. And they think that by promoting a message of fear and condemnation, that they can convince people to become different people and become good Christians, right? What's off, I believe, isn't their motive. What's off is their perception of God and their perception of themselves. So you know what's actually scary about evangelism out of the local church is you can, you can actually give people the ABCs and the one, two, threes of evangelism and they can go out with all the tools and misrepresent Christ door to door to door to door to door. Like, like people, they open the door and they hear all the right words, but there's something off. You know what's missing is an accurate view of who God is and, and what he's like and an accurate understanding of identity. You know what most people don't like about evangelism that aren't saved? Is they feel like you're trying to sell them something. Any of you guys ever not bought a car purposely from a salesman because you felt like you wanted it too bad? Raise your hand. I've done it. Anyone ever bought a car because you felt like the salesman didn't want you to buy the car, so you bought the car because you were like, why doesn't he want me to buy the car? Raise your hand. I'm the only one in the room. Dang it. I did that. I'm a, like, I was, I was in door-to-door uh, -door sales for AJC when I was, like, 18 and 19 years old. And so, like, when I went and bought a car one time, I was, like, waiting for the guy to, like, throw this, like, massive sales pitch. He didn't try. He just kind of, like, showed me the car. He was like, yeah, man, that's, that's the car. I'm like, I'm like, when are you going to put the pressure on? He didn't, you know. I bought the car from the guy. Because I hate it when someone's trying to pressure me into something. Here's what happens. When you don't know your identity... You try to prove your identity by your works. Jesus began his works out of identity. The father said, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he began his ministry. So from a place of identity, he began to do the works, right? But what happens is, is when you begin to do the works to prove that you're significant and important, you are beginning to try to pull out the belt and get notches on them. And guess what? People can tell the difference in a split second when you encounter them at the supermarket, when you go to their door, when you start talking to them at the office, when you go talk to your neighbors, they can tell when they feel like they're just a notch on your belt. And the only reason that notch on your belt evangelism exists in the church, do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say that? I hope I'm not offending people. If you have notches on your belt, I'm sorry. But, but here's, here's what I'm saying. The only reason that that exists in the church is because the church is not walking in her identity. Because when we don't know who we are, we try to prove that we're something. 
And so what's dangerous is you can teach people the methods of evangelism in a city and produce a bunch of high pressure salespeople who don't know who they are and don't really know what the father's like. And they can go out and ruin the impression of the father and also make people feel like that all Christians want to do is twist people's arms and make them religious so they can get to church and get their money. How many of you guys know in the South, that is the general impression of the church? Raise your hand if you believe that. I live in Columbus, which is more Southern than here. So we really Southern. And I would say in Columbus, that's a general consensus is people are fed up. They're waiting for the true sons and daughters to rise up and know their identity and represent God and, and, and represent him in a way where it's not like, man, I got to pressure you into this, but represent God in a way where it's like, I know who I am and I know he's really good. And I know the Bible says that he sent Jesus not to condemn the world. He didn't send Jesus to condemn you. He sent Jesus so that you could be saved. He sent Jesus so that you could enter into a new covenant where no longer is it you trying to be good enough to get to God, but where God comes inside of you and literally gives you a new desire and a new heart. And he takes his law and he writes it on the inside of your heart where literally you start to want to do what's right. That's the good news. Is that through Jesus, you can have that written on your heart. It's not a sales pitch. When you begin to realize it's not that, evangelism sounds a lot more fun. If we went around the country and just hosted worship nights, you know how many thousands of people we could have at our events? But as soon as we begin to tell people in the church that we're going to go share the gospel, you know how many people are suddenly busy? And I'm not saying this to bash people. I'm, I'm just saying this is what I see. This is what I do full time. So this is basically what I see all the time is that people suddenly are busy when it comes to that. And here's what I'll say about that. It's, it's not that the... It's not that people are bad for doing that. It's just that they don't really know who they are. And they're not walking in their true identity. So when you're not walking in your true identity, you're terrified that someone may reject you. And the easiest way to get rejected is go out and do evangelism. Right? I mean, I've had some crazy stuff happen to me while going out and sharing the gospel with people. I've had people mock me, threaten me, all kinds of funny stuff. Weird stuff. When you don't know your identity, your greatest fear is that you would be rejected. Because when you're rejected, your value is diminished. So what you do is you build your entire life hoping that everyone around you will affirm that you have value. So you become a man pleaser rather than a God pleaser. And when you live your life as a man pleaser, the number one thing you can't do is offend someone. Because if you offend them and they reject you, your value is diminished. And the last thing you want to do is feel that your value is diminished. So you build your entire life to make sure that everyone likes you. That's why evangelism is terrifying to the church. But as soon as she and us as the body of Christ, as soon as we begin to step into our identity and we know that our approval comes from God and not from man, then even when we face rejection, we can still stand firm. How many of you guys know the scripture is full of terrifying rejections? The Apostle Paul, I was listening to him this morning, not him literally, but I was listening to the Bible app this morning, 2 Corinthians, and he's telling the Corinthians church, he's like, dude, I got beaten. I got stoned and not like, you know, smoking weed stone. He got like stoned with rocks. I was thinking about this morning. I was like, it's funny, 2,000 years later, that phrase means something so different than what he was writing. Uh, but anyways... He went through so much, and what drove him to keep going, even though he faced the ultimate persecution, was that he knew who he was. You know, I, I've, I've had several friends that have spent time, considerable amounts of time in the Middle East over the last two years. And in fact, I know Sean spent some time there. And I have one friend specifically that was telling me he was there training uh, 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 leaders in a very, very dark and closed nation. And he began to tell them that, that, uh, that they were telling him, they were like, yes, this is amazing. It's amazing to hear that in, in, in the United States that you can do this so freely. I bet, I bet you all love that. I bet that's amazing. And he was like, actually, he's like, most people in America don't do this. And they were like, what? So, like, they get killed in America if they share the gospel? He's like, no, they might get laughed at. And the believers in the persecuted church will begin to weep as they begin to realize. And, and literally the message, my friend, this is what he said. His name's Robbie Dawkins. He said they've, they'll grab him and they'll say, tell the church in America. 
to seize the moment, to seize the opportunity while they have it. Because, you know, in the Middle East, they face death and banishment from their families if they share the gospel. We might get laughed at. And yet we're fearful of that. And the reason is because we don't know who we are. Because being laughed at and receiving rejection, that diminishes our value. That takes away our value. And that's the most terrifying thing if we're a man pleaser. But here's what God wants to do. He wants to take us from man pleasers to become God pleasers. He wants us to walk in the fear of the Lord. That we fear God and not man. I want to show you guys a cycle called the belief expectation cycle. How many of you guys like diagrams? I'm a visual learner. Every meeting I have, I have to have like a pen and a paper because I have to draw what I'm telling people. Any visual learners that way? Raise your hand. Come on. Whoop, whoop. If you look in your, in your booklets, page number six, there's something called the belief expectation cycle. I didn't make this up. This actually comes from a book that's called uh, Biblical Something to Healing and Deliverance. It's Restoring the Foundations. It's good stuff. And I, I like to use this because it like makes sense to me. So at the top of the diagram, what is, what is the top right there? What does that say? Okay, so everything in life begins with experience. And here's, here, here's a, a clear example. No one is born racist. No one is born out of the womb and they pop out and like, oh, dang it, that one was born racist. Crap. <laughs> People are born into a family where every time they drive down the road and see someone that looks different, they say something negative. Or every time the TV pops on, they say, well, that dang politician, all those people that are like that, they're this way. And so they grow up and they experience over and over and over again an environment of racism and bigotry. So what happens is the next thing comes into play, which is belief. Your beliefs begin with experience. Beliefs are formed through what you experience. If you show up in the kindergarten and all the kids won't talk to you in kindergarten, then you may feel like there's something naturally flawed or wrong with you. And, and that may be a, a belief that you deal with throughout your whole kindergarten year. Or you could go in and everybody wants to be your friend and you just feel like you're the bee's knees. You're awesome. Your experience can shape your beliefs. Do you guys agree? Your beliefs determine your expectations. Everyone say expectations. Your expectations are simply what you're expecting will happen. And let's go back to the, the idea of racism. You know, when people uh, believe something about someone, they expect that out of them. And so naturally, you, you see that. I mean, it, it's still even today. You know, people, they'll get around someone that's different than them, and they naturally expect that that person's going to rob them. So what they do, they're like, oh, yeah. you know, got my wallet, right? Or like, honey, lock the door. Why? They believe a certain way and they're expecting, hey, that person may hurt me or that, that person, they look a little shady, right? And this is just racism. They could just look really shady, so you do need to lock your door. But I'm just saying your experience and your beliefs lead to your expectations. When you see that in that situation, you're expecting that to happen. And then your, ex, your expectations will actually determine your behavior. Hey, babe, go lock that, go lock that car door, right? That's behavior, your behavior follows your belief and your expectations in every situation. You behave out of what you believe. Most of the church wants to make you behave, but they don't want to necessarily try to transform what you believe before you behave. Many people avoid the church because they feel like all we're trying to do is make people change behavior. But the reality of the gospel, it, like here's the gospel. Jesus came to die on the cross to restore us into relationship with God so that we could begin to believe differently about him and ourselves so that we could behave differently out of that revelation of who he is. But a lot of people perceive, I'm telling you, most people perceive that Christianity is an invitation to change behavior, become better so that God will approve of you, right? And that's religion. And that's all religion. That's all religion promotes. And that's what separates knowing Jesus from religions in the earth is that it's not change your behavior so you might get right with God, which many other global faiths are based on that, those principles and tenets. Here's the reality of the Christian faith. You believe and then you behave. Amen? Out of belief, your behavior will be transformed. I want to tell you guys a, a, a funny story. My son Landon, he's, uh, 
11 years old, and he played t-ball when he was like five or six. How many of you guys know t-ball is not real baseball? But it was really cute, and like my little, little one now, he loves baseball too, and like Landon was obsessed with baseball. So we got him a t-ball. He played t-ball, and, uh, and, and t-ball was hilarious. Um, and, and then a couple years later, he took a break, and he went back and played baseball. And how many of you guys know as a dad, like you want your kid to be like the best kid? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter, like every guy in this room, you want your boy to be the best boy on the, on the team. Amen? It's just competitive inside of you. You're like, that's my son. And so we get to baseball practice, and I'm, I'm reminiscing the days of T-ball, and I'm like, man, he used to hit that ball so good and run around those bases. And, yeah, he, it, he picked his boogers a lot in the outfield and, you know, didn't really pay attention. But he's older now, so it's gonna, this is going to be a good baseball season. And so we get out there. He's throwing the ball like crazy. He's doing so good. And then we get in the batting cages, and I realize, oh, crap, he's never had to hit a moving baseball. And they start throwing those balls. And he, he looked like a lame duck when he tried to swing that bat. It was, it was funny. He, did, he had no muscle memory. I, I never taught him how to hit the, hit, hit the baseball because you can't go out in your front yard and be like, hey, let's start hitting baseballs at our neighbor's house, right? But you can go out there and throw the ball and not hurt anybody. So, so he was so good at throwing the ball, he had no idea how to even swing a bat. And I'm realizing, like, oh, no, my kid's going to be the worst kid on the team. Oh, crap. I don't know if I could deal with this. And so it got worse. So anyways, practice after practice after practice, Landon could not hit the baseball. And it was like very humiliating for me as a dad. And I was like, man, oh, no. It's just going to, you know, it's going to be tough. So the season starts. And he's number nine. He's a number nine batter. He's the last batter on the team. <laughs> I couldn't blame the coach. Well, I'm a little ashamed. I'm like, man, couldn't he just be six? Like, put him in the middle just because you have some sympathy on the kid. But no, like, he needed to almost, like, not even be on number nine, like, zero or something. Game after game, they put him out there. He couldn't hit the ball. Landon's starting to get frustrated. I'm starting to get frustrated. We're like, man, I, I just, I'm just like, I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, I just don't know if baseball's for Landon, you know, like, maybe football. All right. So, one day we're driving to baseball practice, and, and while we're going to practice, he's like, Dad, he's like, I am the worst baseball hitter ever. I can't hit the ball. And I was thinking in my head, I'm like, you're right, Landon. You are totally right. <laughs> but then my fatherly instinct rose up within me, and I looked at him, and I said, son, I said, Landon, as long as you believe you can't hit the ball, you're not going to hit that ball. And he's like, whatever, Dad. And so we go to practice, and... Uh, he did hit the ball. Um, but a couple, like, days later or a week later, he comes home from practice, and he's so excited. Dad, I hit the baseball into the outfield. And he's, like, glowing. I think he was levitating, like, half an inch off the floor. He was literally, like, exploding with joy. Like, I hit the baseball. And I'm like, yes. Whew, it's over. You know, like, he's going to start hitting the ball. And so we get to the baseball game. And he had told me that at practice, they played this game called King of the Hill, which I don't to this day know what they did. But it, it was a game, and while they were playing the game, he started hitting the ball. And so they get to the baseball uh, game, and once again, he's like number 10, you know. And so we get to the game, and sure enough, all the hitters go through, and finally it's Landon's turn, and I'm just like, okay, dear Jesus, right now, I just pray if you hear any prayer. Just make him hit the ball on accident, God. You know, I'm like, help him. You know, like, you're like, you want your kids to do good. And so I'm sitting there, and, and suddenly out of, out of the, uh, the cage, his teammates start chanting, king of the hill, king of the hill, king of the hill, king of the hill. I'm like, why are they saying king of the hill? I'm like, I'm thinking about the TV show. I'm like, king of the hill. I'm like, and then I remember that, that game they played. And suddenly the, the, the ball comes and pop, Landon hits it out in the outfield and he gets on the base. And like everyone was like, yes. And like Landon, he runs and he gets on the base. He's like, did that really just happen? You know, he's like, he was more shocked than anyone. And all the other parents were like completely blown away. They're like, oh, Landon hit the ball finally, you know. <laughs> I'm like, he's going to be good now. Well, I want to tell you, now, now Landon is definitely one of the best baseball, like in the last season, he was one of the better baseball players on his team. And he's, he's learned how to hit the ball, and he's, he's an amazing, uh, just an athlete. But here's what I want to look at. 
you know, when Landon showed up to the, the practice, you know, his previous experience in T-ball was every time he got up to bat, he hit the ball, right? Because the ball was sitting on the tee. So he thought he was going to hit the ball, but then suddenly he started having these new experiences. First practice, what was the new experience? Missing the ball. So what happened is his, his former belief that he thought he could hit the ball suddenly was transformed and he received a new belief. And the new belief was, I can't hit the ball. And so what happened is, is every single time Landon would get up to bat, what is he expecting? I'm not going to hit the ball. And one of the things about baseball is hitting the ball is directly connected to timing. You have to time your swing. But timing is directly connected to confidence. If you're not confident, you'll always swing late. If you don't think you're going to hit the ball, you're going to hesitate. If you hesitate, you'll never hit the ball. Thereby, not thinking you can hit the ball actually will lead to you not hitting the ball. So over and over and over again, he would have that experience, and then it would revalidate itself. He would get up to bat. He wouldn't hit the ball. What would that do? Reaffirm this belief that he would never hit the ball. But suddenly, something happened. A new experience happened. I believe that's just going to happen tonight. There's going to be some new experiences around the room. God's going to encounter you tonight. There's going to be some shifts in people's lives. Even some of you, you've, you've been walking with the Lord for a long time. I really believe the Lord's saying that tonight, there's going to be some, there's going to be a new revelation tonight that God's going to speak to you that is actually going to shift and transform the way you're living your life. I'm not saying that because I'm going to do it. I believe Holy Spirit, he's here and he wants to begin to touch lives tonight in a powerful way. Here's the reality. When Landon was reminded that he hit the ball during King of the Hill, he began to believe that he could hit the ball. And he swung with the right timing because he was expecting it. And guess what happened? His behavior followed. He started hitting the ball. See, what you believe determines your expectation and transform your behavior. If you believe that rejection equals diminished value in your life, then you expect evangelism will equal rejection. So your behavior will follow like this. God will say, the Holy Spirit will whisper, hey, go talk to so-and-so. Go share the gospel with this person. And you'll say no because you believe that rejection will diminish your value and you're scared of that or you don't want to be rejected by someone or you don't want to be looked down upon or you don't want it to go not the way that you want it to go or whatever. So you're expecting they're going to reject you. So what happens is Holy Spirit saying, hey, turn around, turn around, go talk to that person or call your neighbor, or call your family member and you leave the phone alone or you ignore that person and your behavior begins to follow your beliefs. The church doesn't need another sermon on the Great Commission. The church has heard millions of amazing exegesis of Matthew chapter 28, Mark 16, Acts chapter 1. Praise the Lord. And what's amazing is all those sermons do not equal people sharing the gospel. Like it's like a 1% return or a 0.01% return. Like very little of these messages are transforming people. Here's what I believe. People know what the Bible says and they know what they should be doing. But the barrier is, is the fear of man and the fear of rejection. You can preach and preach and preach and listen to sermons all day. You can go watch Todd White YouTube videos every single morning for the rest of your life. But if you don't begin to overcome this reality and step into your identity, you'll never live this out in a true and an honest and an authentic way. God wants you to step into your identity. And I believe tonight that God's going to shatter some lies. And here's what I want to do just right now. Just we're going to take a couple minutes. We're going to do an activity. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to open up your mind and your heart and to realize that deception is deceiving. That you could actually be dealing with lies that you've had for your entire life that you haven't realized you've been dealing with. That Holy Spirit even tonight wants to expose and touch something you may not want him to touch. But he wants to deal with something and get it out of the way. That's why you're here tonight. <laughs> you didn't come here to hear a worship song. I really believe God's brought you here because he actually wants to lift veils and remove lies in people's lives. And he wants to bring us into truth. Because here's the reality. When you begin to believe rightly about God and you begin to be believe rightly about who he says you are, you can begin to behave rightly. You can only obey the great commission and the great commandments when you begin to believe that the father is who he says he is through the revelation of his son, Jesus. And you begin to believe that you are who he says you are. And that's what he wants to do tonight. Let's look at Luke chapter 15 in closing. Turn in, actually, 
I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let's just look at, it's right here on page number seven. Luke chapter 15, the setting of Luke chapter 15 is Jesus is talking to the religious and he's talking to the sinners. The religious are on one side, the sinners are on the other. And uh, uh, Luke actually records in verses one and two that the religious people, that they were, they were kind of behind Jesus' back complaining that Jesus was hanging out with sinners. And in response to their complaints about Jesus spending so much time with sinners, Jesus tells them three parables. And in those three parables, Jesus begins to reveal the heart of the Father. And the reason he's doing that is because not only did the sinners not know who the Father was, but even the religious that were in the temple day after day, they didn't even know who the Father was and what he was like. The purpose of the three parables in Luke chapter 15 are to point to people the revelation of the Father and the revelation of who they're called to be. And I believe that Luke chapter 15, that through the context, verses 1 and 2, that actually the three parables weren't pointed at the sinners, they were pointed at the religious. Here's why I believe that. At the end of Luke chapter 15, Jesus finally begins to get to the point of what he was saying in all of those parables. And if you look in your Bible in Luke chapter 15, many of your Bibles above the passage we're about to read, it says the parable of the prodigal son. Those captions above sections of scripture are not scripture. Those are man-made kind of written captions that people put there to help you know what you're about to read. Here's what I would say about that caption. I would actually call it the parable of the last son. I'm not saying I would change the Bible. I'm just saying I would change the caption. Because in my study of Luke chapter 15, I actually believe that the whole point of Luke 15 is pointing straight at the second son. And we're going to look at that right now. It says, now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. So you guys know the context of this, right? This is the parable where there's two sons. One son takes his inheritance early. He goes and squanders it all on living in sin, right? And then he loses everything and decides he could just go back and be a slave in his father's house. But from a long way off, as he's going home, the father sees him, runs to him, gives him a robe and ring and sandals. And he tells everybody, let's throw a party for he's back. My son who is dead, he's come back to life. And it's a story of, of sinners coming back into the household of faith. It's, it's a story of humanity coming back to God. And this is the context of the older son was out in the field working. And then suddenly he hears about this party. And it says in the next part, it says, but he was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he, but he answered his father and he said, look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And then the father says to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. I want to point out one simple thing. The son, when he begins to respond to the father, he says this. He says, look, these many years I have served you. If you read the New King James Version, it says this. Look, these many years I have slaved for you. Who did the older son think he was? Say it really loud. Who did the older son think he was? You know, positionally, you can be a son. You can be a son positionally, but actually experientially live as a slave. I'm going to say this again. Positionally, you can be a son. Experientially, you can live as a slave. The problem isn't position, it's belief. The older son, his issue wasn't that he was a slave and he needed to figure out how to become a son. He was already a son. The problem was that he believed he was a slave, even though he was a son. You know, you can be a son and believe you're a slave. You know, you can be a son and live like a slave. I've experienced it over and over and over again. Is this sinking in right now? 
He believed he was a slave, but he was actually a son. Here's what God wants to do tonight. He wants to smash lies that are causing us to live as slaves, even though we're actually positionally sons and daughters. Because you know what those lies are doing? They're preventing us from experiencing what we rightfully deserve. Positionally, you're a son and a daughter. If you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a son, you're a daughter. Nothing can take that from you. Nothing can take you from his hand. But the reality is, the lies in your mind can separate you from experiencing the joy of what positionally you deserve. You deserve the inheritance. You deserve the fat and calf. And I want to point something out. He says, look, these many years I've slaved for you and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And the father says, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. What he's basically saying is all you had to do was ask. You know, there's some crazy promises that Jesus said, like promises like ask anything and it shall be done for you. And he, and he said it over and over again, I think because he wanted us to like get a, get a point. And here's, here's the reality. Many times we ask not because we actually don't believe that the father's going to give it to us. You know, positionally he was a son and positionally all he had to do was ask his dad and he could have had the party with his friends. But he spent his entire life actually missing out, not because he didn't have access not because it wasn't right there waiting for him, but because actually he was believing wrongly about who he was. The lies in his mind, that's what was actually preventing him from his experiencing what he truly deserved. And what God wants to do is he wants to smash those lies and replace them with truth. Romans 12, transform us by the renewing of our minds. And tonight what he wants to do, like right now what he's about to do is he's, he's gonna take some lies that people are struggling with and he's going to expose them. And even right now, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just come and that you would expose lies that don't belong to us. And I pray, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate with your word and with your spirit right now, just things that are preventing us from, from walking in what you've called us to walk in. I believe that the last thing that the Father says right here is actually the answer to overcoming this struggle. And here's what I want to say. The first thing the father says to him is what? Say it out loud. The first way to overcome this, like even tonight, is just to realize that you're a son, you're a daughter, that you're his, that you're not like just working, 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 trying to prove that you're his, but you're, you're just his. Like not because of what you're doing, but you're, you're just his. You know, he wants, he, tonight what he wants to do is he just wants to take his hand and his seal of approval. And he just wants to remind you, you're my son, you're my daughter. And I believe this is the number one thing, like in my personal life, this is where Satan tries to attack me the most. He wants to try to invite me back into slavery, even though positionally I'm a son. And he does that through so many things. He does that while I'm in full-time ministry on a daily basis. Hey, try to work for it. You think God's really gonna take care of you? You need that platform to show your significance. Why don't you have the microphone in the room? Why aren't you the guy talking? You know more than that, dude. Right? All those things are directly tied to, tied to us not knowing, son. There's liberty and there's freedom right now in this place. There's freedom. The Holy Spirit's here. And he just wants to release that over you. If you want to receive that, just put out your hands to say, Lord, I received the affirmation from you. Right now, he's just, by his spirit, right now, he's just touching hearts. Just let him just begin to minister to you. He wants to affirm you. And this isn't me. I'm not trying to muster up anything right now. This is not emotionalism. But I just really just sense like fa the father just wants to say, he is so proud to call you son or daughter. He's not ashamed to say that about you. He actually delights in saying that that's who you are. Psalm 139, we were talking about that last night. His thoughts about you are limitless. The second thing that the father says right here is he says, you're always with me. The second way to overcome what we're talking about tonight is to begin to realize that God's presence is always with you. You know, when you're in the Walmart and you see somebody in a wheelchair, you see some really tough situation in front of you and the Holy Spirit, like he does so many times to me, he just says, you need to go pray for that woman in that wheelchair. And you're thinking in your head, 
are you crazy? You know, like, I am busy. I got, some, I got to call someone. I got to call my mom. You know, my mom. I need to call her. I haven't talked to her in three days. You know, like, you justify every reason not to do it, right? When, when we look at someone in a wheelchair or an impossible situation in our family or something that's going on, and we live with the reality that we think, basically, we live our lives, that we're hearing God somewhere up there, Okay then what happens is, is when Holy Spirit starts to tell us to step into impossible and tough situations, we don't want to do it because we feel like he's way up there and we're way down here. But here's the reality. The father says this, you're always with me. He's trying to impress upon the son the reality of his presence. When you know the father, the God, the creator of the universe is with you in the Walmart and he begins to whisper in your heart to go do something and you realize he's there, guess what? You're going to be a lot more bold to be obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Evangelism becomes easy and natural when you go talk to a bunch of teenage boys skipping class and, or skipping school in a Target. You're willing to do that if you know that he's with you. Do you guys know that he's always with you? Like every situation, every hard situation, do you guys know that he's always with you? When you begin to realize his presence, it changes everything. The last thing he says is this, all that is mine is yours. Say that together, all that is mine is yours. The last thing the father releases over him is a reality of his provision. You know, many of us live stingy lives, whether it's financially, whether it's with our emotions. Men. We live stingy lives because we actually think he's stingy. You're in the Walmart, the lady in front of you, she's putting all her groceries on there. Holy Spirit says, buy your groceries. You're like, sure, I'll do it. And then you start looking at her cart. You're like, was that God? Or like, what the, that's a weird thought. I got to move to that other aisle over here. <laughs> you know? If you think he's stingy, you won't step out in that moment. But if you realize this right here, he says, all that's mine is yours. When the Holy Spirit says, buy $300 worth of groceries, you'll pull out your car. You say, ma'am, I'm buying those groceries for you. And she'll begin to weep and cry uncontrollably and begin to tell you all the things going on in her life and how she's overwhelmed and doesn't know what to do. And you begin to be able to share the gospel with her and begin to release the kingdom of God through radical generosity. You can only step into radical generosity when the reality of who the father is and what he's like and the fact that you have access to everything that's his, can you step into generosity. He wants to release radical generosity tonight. He wants to break people out of a spirit of poverty tonight. I'm not just talking about money, and I'm not trying to, like, we're not going to take up a second offering in a minute. This is like, no, this is to liberate you to just be generous. To just, when, when somebody asks you for something, you're just like, okay, I'll do that. God will give me another t-shirt, you know, like, you like my shirt, you want it? Okay, here you go, homeless guy in downtown Atlanta. You know, take my jacket, you know, it's paid $99 for that, you know. But, but you'll be willing to be a bit more generous when you walk in this revelation. God wants to liberate us. To be radically generous, not only with our money, but with our time, with our emotions, with our, with our friendships, with our connections, with our business ties, with the way we run our businesses, with the way we manage our families, with all the things. Like suddenly when we begin to realize that all that is his is ours, we can become generous. Everybody stand up. We're going to do an activity. You guys ready? How many of you guys feel like the Holy Spirit's just like touching on something? Right now. I feel like that God, I feel like that God just wants to, he wants to release some, some, some grace and some freedom. And here's what I want to say is just everything that I'm saying tonight is not something that anyone in the room, including myself, is totally free from. Every one of us are going to struggle in this on a daily, weekly basis. It's going to be a place where we're going to be tempted to step back into slavery. But as soon as we begin to let God transform our belief systems, then we can begin to step into freedom. Then we can begin to share our faith. Then we can begin to discover the joy of representing Jesus in our everyday lives. Amen. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes and we're going to do an activity all across this room. And here's, here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to name off common lies that people struggle with. If you're dealing with this lie that I, that, I, that I name, I just want you to raise your hand. 
And so all across the room, keep your eyes closed. But just if you acknowledge, like, hey, that's something I'm dealing with. That's something that I'm going through. I struggle with, maybe not all the time, but sometimes that pops up in my head. If that even pops up in your head, I'm telling you, the, the enemy wants to be able to use that against you. And so God wants to replace that with truth in the deepest places of your heart. And he's going to do that tonight. After I begin to mention those things, what we're going to do is then we're going to pray together. And we're going to actually ask the Holy Spirit to tell us what we need to believe in the place of those lies. And then what we're going to do is all across the room, people are going to begin to boldly declare this. I choose to believe. You know, whatever God says. You know, one of the things that most changed my life, I did an activity like this one time. It changed my life. And God just began to show me I was trying to do so much to prove that I was important. And he touched on that. And I was like, man, I feel so convicted. <laughs> and you know what God said to me? He said, I want you to know that you're my son and I'm, I'm proud. I'm proud of you right now. And I declared, I said, I choose to believe that I'm your son and, and, and that you're proud of me. You know what I did for a month? I, I declared that every morning as I made my, my coffee. It changed my life more than anybody laying hands or whatever. You know, like it, more than any encounter at the altar. Like just that actually made one of the most dynamic shifts in my life. Me starting to believe that God's proud of me. So I don't have to please you. I don't have to prove anything. He's proud. That's amazing. You know, when he spoke that to me, it changed everything. So what I want you to do tonight is as God begins to speak across the room, I want you to boldly declare out loud what God's saying. There's power in that declaration. Amen. So let's close our eyes right now. Let me just pray for you. And then as I declare things, if these are lies that you're struggling with, just acknowledge that to the Lord. Holy Spirit, thank you for being here. I pray for revelation truth. I pray for each and every one of us that we would begin to um, uh, be willing to part ways with things maybe that we've been holding on to for a long time. Part ways with lies and step into truth. And so right now, if you, if you feel like sometimes you struggle with feeling like one of the illustrations that God's really far away, if you struggle feeling like he's far, he's not close, raise your hand. If you struggle believing the lie that God's not going to take care of you financially, like you struggle sometimes thinking like, I, I just don't know if God's going to take care of me that way. If you struggle feeling like God is never satisfied with what you're doing, like it's just not enough, like you just feel like he's looking at you and he's like, oh, that's good, but okay, you need to do more. If you struggle with just feeling like he's not ever pleased, if you struggle believing the lie that God is actually angry, like just angry all the time, if you struggle believing the lie that God actually wants bad things for you, like he wants bad things, I, that's kind of a weird thing. But it, like, if you believe that, like somehow you struggle just thinking, I, I just think God just wants bad things to happen to me. Just begin to acknowledge that. If you struggle believing simply that other people, their perception and approval of you determines your value. If you struggle stumbling into that, just acknowledge that to the Lord. I'm raising both hands myself. We all fall into that. If you struggle believing the lie that you're unattractive or unwantable or just there's something flawed with you, you just look at yourself sometimes and you're like, oh, if you struggle with self-image, like, man, I, it's something off, something wrong, just acknowledge that to the Lord. If you struggle thinking that there's just sin in your life, you'll never overcome. There's just things that you just can't get over. Just acknowledge that to the Lord. Be honest. If that struggle thinking, I just won't overcome certain things. If you struggle uh, believing, you know, the lie about yourself, that there's some things that you've done that just are never going to go away like, like sin. There's certain sins you've committed that are just always going to haunt you. Just acknowledge that to the Lord. You believe that lie. Like there's certain things. They're just skeletons that are going to stay in that closet and they're never going to go away. If you feel like you're a failure, just acknowledge that to the Lord. You feel like you're a failure. If you feel like you're inherently bad, like I'm bad, acknowledge that to the Lord. If you feel that you're not good enough, just acknowledge that to the Lord. Let's pray together. Just keep your eyes closed. Say, Father, 
I confess the sin of believing and participating with lies from the enemy. And I receive your forgiveness tonight. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses me from all sin, makes me new, gives me pure thoughts, new thoughts. Thank you for your word that changes the way I think about myself, about others, about you. Tonight I choose to break every agreement with demons and with the kingdom of darkness. I sever all agreements tonight in Jesus' name. In the place of every lie, God, what do you want me to believe tonight? What would you have me believe in the place of those lies? Hallelujah. Just be still for just a minute. Now, what I want you to do is just let him speak to you, okay? And what I want to ask is if you're on the far side of the room, I want you to kind of say it loud because there may be someone on the other side of the room that's like not hearing something. And when you say what you're saying, they needed to hear what you're going to say, okay? I've seen it happen so many times where somebody's breakthrough over here, someone else needed to hear that. There's also something powerful about a, an outward declaration of saying, I, I agree that this is true about God or about myself, okay? So what I want you to do is just, just begin to op open your uh, hands like you're receiving from the Lord, close your eyes, and just say, God, what do you want me to believe? What I want you to do, just around the room, just keep your eyes closed, but just begin to declare what you sense God is saying to you. Just declare it out loud. Say this, say, I choose to believe. I feel like some of, I feel like the Lord's saying right now, just wait just one second, you can keep your eyes closed. I feel like the Lord's saying that, that it's okay to have fun, it's okay to rest. I, I feel like, you, like right now, God actually wants to release a, a, a new godly belief that it's okay to rest, it's okay to have fun. If that's you, just, just receive that right now. I feel like, like literally raise your hands if that's you. I want to just pray. God, I just pray that you would release liberty over the church to enjoy things again. I pray for striving to be broken over us tonight. And I just release over you the, the uh, you know, when my two-year-old likes to go pee, pee on the potty, you know, that is so fun for me. And he's just pee, -pee on the potty. You know, God enjoys you having fun. Like when my son's throwing the baseball, like I enjoy him having fun. God enjoys it when you enjoy things. So I just release that over people right now that God is okay with you enjoying things in life. So just receive that right now, freedom from the Lord to experience joy. All right, keep declaring what he's been saying and just keep going, keep going. There's, there's, God's moving right now. going to ask the worship team to come back up here. Just keep, just keep declaring those things.
She just said, I choose to believe your children shall be saved. Who just said that? Raise your hand. Okay. My Nana right here. So she was born. She was of nine kids. And Grandma Wilson, all nine of them were, were uh, hooligans. Including my Nana. You wouldn't believe it. And Mama Wilson prayed, and all nine, including some of some of her brothers, came to Christ in their 50s. Late in life, they eventually came to Christ, every single one of them. So I just declare, raise your hand if you need to receive that right now for your kids. You're believing that. So God, I thank you that the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. I thank you, Lord, that the story of prodigals coming home, that even right now, I just declare that. Come home in Jesus' name. Lord, we choose to believe our kids are going to serve you, that our kids are going to be powerful vessels for your kingdom in the earth. Just declare, just say, I choose to believe my kids are coming home. Just declare their names right now all across the room. If you got prodigals right now, come on. We're calling them home tonight. You know, my, my dad's dad, my dad's dad, my Nana prayed for him for like 13 years. And he was an avid atheist and a womanizer and wanted nothing to do with church. My Nana prayed for 13 years. He literally woke her up in the middle of the night one night and said, God wouldn't let him sleep. And God said, come to the living room. You need to give your life to me right now. And my, it changed the lineage of my family. And I released that testimony. Literally, I declare sleepless nights over prodigals right now that they're coming home in Jesus' name. And I just prophesy that right now. I just release that into the atmosphere that people are coming home. People are coming in the kingdom. Even tonight, I declare text messages. What do I need to do to get right with God? I'm coming to church with you this weekend, Mom. God's releasing that right now. I want you to pray with your neighbors right now. If you've got a prodigal, I want you to agree in prayer right now. We're going to go into worship. If you need prayer for that right now, I feel like just there's something on this right now. Raise your hand. I want you to gather around anyone, and I want you to ask the name of their kid. I want you to pray. We're going to pray for these prodigals to go home. Come on, get out of your seats right now. Let's just go find those that are that are in need of prayer. We're going to, we're going to call them home. Hallelujah. We call them home right now. We call them every prodigal in Jesus' name. We say, come home. For nothing is impossible with God. 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 We just release that right now over every story, over every family in Jesus' name. We pray for salvation, healing, and deliverance to be released into these families. We declare right now generational curses are broken tonight. We declare breakthrough. We pray, God, that any deception, any demonic things that are happening in people's lives, that you would break that and remove that in Jesus' name.
is a name. There is a name. Reaching past the margins, calling sons and daughters back to him. Yet as he saved, we can hear the roar of heaven as prodigals are coming home again. Or oh, the triumph, or oh, the triumph. Prodigals are coming home again. Oh, the triumph of his name will never end. Four, four. 
from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Sing day and night. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. blessed tonight. Amen. You come back tomorrow, 7 p.m., and you'll get blessed again. I want to just thank you for coming out. Enjoy. Go out there. There's going to be a merchandise table. Sean, you have some merchandise out there, correct? Yes, and so go out there and grab New some CD. stuff. A new CD. Yeah. Let's go out and grab some stuff. Enjoy your time, and we'll see you back tomorrow night.